Hello and welcome to yet another guest segment of the Breakfast Connect on Africa Business Radio. I am Chukunonso Modi. Today we are talking about cyber crime. Yes, we have been hearing of so many breaches over the last few years and even months. These are true signs that warn us about how rapidly the cybersecurity industry is progressing. And as each day goes by, there are new devices that are connected to the internet. And as newer devices get connected to the internet, there are newer methods of exploitation that have been researched and invented every day. Joining me to talk about cybercrime's evolution and the way forward is a seasoned cybersecurity expert with more than 20 years of experience. He is the Director of Cybersecurity and Incident Response at Performanta. Please help me welcome Mr. Stephen Krush. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here, Stephen. Thank you. It's good to be invited. Okay. So this leads me to the question, how has cybercrime evolved over the years? How bad can it get? Well, you know, when I started out in in computer security 20 years ago, Mm -hmm. you know, attackers existed. But generally what they would do is break into your website and then, you know, upload some funny graphic or or leave some form of crude message. Mm. And so it wasn't a case of, you know, financial impact, whereas now cybercrime has turned into an industry all on its own. Okay. So... You know, if you think about the financial impact, cybercrime now exceeds $1 trillion per annum, mm. with some estimates of it going up to, to $6 trillion. Wow. Uh, And this is larger than the annual drug trade. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, we have ransom, ransomware attacks, mm. where organizations get locked out of their own systems, mm-hmm. uh, their data gets encrypted, they can't service and support their clients, and this impacts the bottom line. And if they don't pay a ransom of, you know, millions of dollars in some cases, the attackers will publish their data on the internet in order to embarrass them. And Mm -hmm. this may result in regulatory fines. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then COVID has also had an impact on on, uh, cybercrime as well. So there's a, you know, plethora of issues around this and it's certainly increased and matured a lot and it's a big issue for us currently okay all right okay this leads me to this question is there a value chain to the cybercrime world because i mean with the figures you call that means people are making huge money off it so if there is a value chain how do they operate well you know there definitely is a a value chain Mm -hmm. and if we take an example of ransomware So, you know, one of the first steps would be for a a group within the value chain called initial access brokers. And these are the hackers that break into organizations and basically open up the hole that somebody else can use at a later stage. These initial access brokers then sell the security hole or this backdoor into an organization systems to the ransomware crew. Now, uh, even within the ransomware space, there's a value chain where the you know professional ransomware developers build the software and they provide backend support. But effectively, they operate on a ransomware as a service model, where it's almost like a, a franchise. And so the you know the ransomware operators effectively lease the ransomware. Yeah. They break into systems and then. The, Original authors take a cut of the proceeds at the end. Mm, take a cut. So it's a big business. That's what you're telling us. It is. It's huge. All right. So let's move on to the victims now. In your article, you spoke about how people don't even realize that the chances of being a cybercrime victim are much higher than they think. And I agree with that because recently I had a friend who fell victim and he fell victim in a way that he did not even expect. So it came as so much as a shock to him that they could scam him in that manner. So what are the various modes or manners they use now that people are not aware of? In fact, sometimes we are aware of them, but it just feels so different. Like they can't get to me or they can't catch me. Most times that's what people feel like. Yeah, so I think, you know, it depends on whether, you know, you're an individual, uh, you know, or a family versus, say, a large organization. Mm. A lot of the time that, you know, in the individual space, 
what the hackers might be after is things like your internet banking credentials yeah. or, you know, mobile money wallets and so on. And so, you know, the way they would target you is through things like spear phishing, you know, sending you spam emails, yeah. sending you links to click on. And then when you click on those links, either you get enticed to give up your username and password. And these are typically, you know, emails that might tell you, you know, you're about to lose access to your account. Please mm. act now urgently and so on. And by placing you under pressure, what the hackers are doing is getting you to kind of bypass your normal logical thinking mm -hmm. where you might, might be a bit more cautious and to do something that, you know, on a normal day, you typically wouldn't. There's even evidence now to suggest that, you know, hackers target specific times of the day uh, and, and specifically between, you know, 2 p.m. and 6 p.m., mm -hmm. uh, where people are a little bit less alert and, and so on. Another way is that, you know, you, you get enticed to download, say, free software. It looks like a great yeah. you know, uh, app that you're going to run on your phone. It's going to do something special that, you know, you haven't seen any other app do. And once you install that application, it's got uh, backdoor functionality built in and it starts siphoning data off of your, of your phone. And this could be things like your SMSs, mm -hmm. your call record, your WhatsApp messages, and various other information. Mm. So, you know, all of this can then be used to, to defraud you. I've also got relatives who, mm. who have been defrauded. They've fallen for, you know, support scams where yeah. somebody phones them and says, this is Microsoft phoning and, you know, we need to fix something on your PC and please enter your credit card details. So, you know, th this is happening every day out there. And then, you know, the, the large organizations and enterprises, some of these kinds of attacks are also used. Uh, but there's some other modes as well. Okay. So would you say most of the attacks are random or some of these cyber criminals actually target a particular person or an organization to carry out their act? I think, uh, you know, a lot of the sort of vanilla or day-to-day -day type attacks on individuals are fairly random. Okay. What would happen is, you know, you would might sign up for some kind of service on a website And we've all seen, you know, these data breaches where email addresses have been stolen from Facebook and LinkedIn and various other platforms. And then the hackers use that, those email addresses to send out a, a spam campaign. You know, if only 1% of those people click on the link, uh, then, you know, the, there's still somebody who's going to fall for it and who's going to be susceptible. Mm. Of course, there's a totally different kind of attack on individuals, which is highly targeted. And this would include things like espionage. Okay. So, for example, there's you know spyware software that is used by governments to target other governments and, and individuals in those governments. Mm. Uh, the French recently reported that uh, three of their ministers have been targeted with, uh, with uh, spyware. And those type of attacks are, are highly targeted. Okay. In the in the large organization space, a lot of it is kind of day to day, but then you also have you know some targeted attacks like ransomware, where it doesn't make sense for the hackers to target a small organization that maybe doesn't have the the ability to pay. Yeah. Uh, so you know larger organizations who are critically dependent on their IT systems, who need them to be up and available, and who have sensitive data are, you know, good targets for a ransomware attack. Okay, okay. So this leads me to this question. What is the way forward? Like, what is the most effective way to build proper security? In fact, proper security these days, we have seen instances where proper security has been hacked. So what can companies, people do to protect themselves? Well, you know, I, I think it's a combination of people, process and technology elements. And, you know, the first step really is is awareness and educating yourself on the risks. Mm -hmm. So if you are a, a board member or a director or management level within a large organization, so you need to know uh, what, uh, you know, what you're up against. And I, I think that level of of awareness has certainly increased over the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, you know, in security, 10 years ago, we didn't hear that much from, say, the board level. Uh, whereas now, you know, we get a lot of questions around ransomware and so on. So certainly 
uh, organizations are, are getting more familiar with the risks. The key thing really, though, is that, you know, you need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And at that level, you can delegate responsibility for security, but you can't delegate accountability. Mm. Um, you know, as you know, as the board of a company, you need to have plans in place for, for security. So what we uh, quite often uh, help larger organizations do is a maturity assessment and build out a security plan. So we look at what is their current level of maturity and where they have gaps and then put the plan in place to close those gaps over time. That obviously becomes key then on the, you know, the, the executive leadership of a company to provide budget and certainly to, to measure progress against that security plan. And one of the key things that we do that I think opens a lot of eyes is we do what we refer to as tabletop simulations. Okay. So we sit down with, uh, you know, the security team, the chief information officer, the chief security officer around the table and we give a scenario and we start asking, how are you going to respond to the scenario? What actions are you going to take? How are you going to investigate it? And uh, this really helps organizations to test whether their written incident management and response procedures and policies actually work mm -hmm. um, or where the gaps are and they, need to, and they need to close them. And then, you know, there's a range of other things like making sure that when a vendor releases uh, patches for software that you're running like Windows, uh, that that is installed and that happens every month. But it's quite common for us to find organizations where they, you know, have not deployed those those security patches. And then those result in holes that the hackers can exploit. Okay. Uh, I think, you know, you touched on a key aspect earlier, which is around awareness of people and, and yeah. end users. Yeah. And so this is around, you know, providing security training, how to spot a phishing email, you know, what to do, how to, you know, just ignore it and so on. And then lastly, you know, I could go into tons more detail, but I think keeping it at a high level, lastly, make sure that you, you partner with somebody who's helping you with your security, especially in light of the security skills shortage that we find ourselves with in the cybersecurity industry. Yeah. So, you know, get help from people who know what they're doing. Okay. Okay, now one last thing before we go. What role does the government have to play? I mean, are there measures in place to help companies, people who fall victim to this cyber crime? Because so many of them lose money, they lose so much, and it's a struggle to come back up. So what role can government play? Um, there's a number of areas. You know, I think if, if we were, you know, uh, living in the U.S., uh, we would have organizations like the, the FBI that we could call upon, uh, or in certain cases, you know, the Secret Service and, and some other organizations. Um, but, you know, we, we're a little bit, uh, a little bit constrained, I guess, uh, in, in Africa. Yeah. We, we need to, governments need to make sure that they've got the, le you know, the right level of cyber security experience. Uh, within their um, investigation and their prosecution teams, they should make sure that there is a clear, uh, you know, definition of cybersecurity and what these cyber attacks are. Uh, for example, things like sentencing guidelines mm -hmm. uh, as well. And then you need to form partnerships with, you know, the international organisations, uh, things like uh, like Europol and Interpol. Uh, a lot of the cyber crime is, you know, is cross-border. Um, you can be sitting in South Africa, for example, and you can be attacked by somebody in Russia. Uh, okay. And so there needs to be that that uh, that cross-border, uh, you know, cooperation and and working together because this is a this is not a challenge that any individual country can resolve by themselves. Yeah, it needs true. to be resolved, you know, globally. All right. Yes. Awareness and cooperation. Thank you very much, Mr. Stephen, for this wonderful conversation. Thank you. All right. That was Mr. Stephen Krush, Director of Cybersecurity and Incident Response at Performanta. The Breakfast Connect will continue in just a moment. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 